I want to thank everyone again for coming and welcome to the Plastic Pollution Solution Panel. We are so glad you could come join us. Please drop any questions you have in the chat box. We will try to answer as many as we can, but we are on a pretty tight timeline. If we are unable to answer your questions during the panel, we will send your questions to the panelists and, and we will provide these responses on our webpage. Please remember though to be respectful in the comments in the chat box. I'm Riley Goldfarb from the Redondo Reducers. I'm a sophomore at Redondo Union High School, currently participating in the Grade to Green Climate Solutions Campaign. My environmental project is to educate and motivate people to reduce their use. Oh, can you move that? Thank you. Um, uh, my project is to educate and motivate people to reduce their use of single-use plastics and to switch the responsibility from plastic waste and pollution to the producers of plastic. To do this, I provided a link to watch the documentary, The Story of Plastic, to those who were interested, and I'm hosting this panel to discuss the issues and potential solutions to our plastic dilemma. Plastic pollution is a big issue, and it's one of the main causes of climate change. Yes, you heard me correctly. 99% of what goes into plastic, plastic is fossil fuels. We need to understand that this item's impact on climate change is the same as coal and coal plants, car emissions, and greenhouse gases. The next slide, please. The problem with plastic is not just littering. At every step, this life cycle of, uh, sorry, at every step of its life cycle, plastic pollutes. Here's a, here's a diagram of the toxic plastic cycle. With the extract, starting with the extraction process, transporting and refining the materials, the production of the plastic items, distributing them for consumption, and lastly, distributing them in landfills, recycling centers, or incinerators, as you can see. Plastic pollutes the air and water with toxins and leaches chemicals into the land. It results in loss of habitat. It can result in oil spills or pipeline explosions. My microplastics contaminate and accumulate in food chains, and it is a major source of greenhouse gas emissions which is really bad when you think about it. The next slide, please. The three R solution, reduce, reuse, recycle, has a big problem. Most consumers focus on recycle out of sight, out of mind, but it isn't going away. 91% of plastic is never recycled. There is 300 million tons of new plastic created each year. And 40% of that is for single use which never degrades and essentially lasts forever. We are going in the wrong direction. Even worse, our government pays $5.2 trillion in fossil fuel subsidies a year to keep costs low for plastic production for corporations. What does this say about our government that prioritizes polluters over humans? And here are the four worst polluters. Well, I know I just bombarded you with a lot of heavy information. Our goal tonight is to focus on the solutions to stop plastic pollution and end climate change. To help with this, we are fortunate to have three great guest speakers tonight. We will be starting out learning about the Break Free from Plastic movement, then move on to learn about political advocacy, and finally end with concrete ways you can reduce your use. Don't worry, by the end of this, Hour, you will be so motivated and inspired to take action. Now let's get started. For our first topic, we are going to hear more about plastic pollution and the break free from plastic movement from Annika Ballant, the educator director at Algorita. Annika has been studying and educating others about the plastic issue since 2010. Her academic background is in the earth sciences. As an undergrad at Jacobs University Bremen, she studied how microplastics move underwater and later completed a master's in geology at the University of Western Ontario, studying microplastics in the sediments of Lake Ontario. Since then, she's been developing educational content around the complexities of the plastic issue at the nonprofit Algolita to empower and prepare young people to take action on this issue. Now here's Annika. 
Hi, everybody. And thank you, Riley, so much for putting this together. And you've done such an amazing job. So I'm really happy to be here. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Yes. Um, I, I don't know how many of you all got to see the, the story of plastic film already, but uh, this film is a really incredible tool that can help us start to see the human side of the plastics issue. And um, as part of Al Galita, which is uh, an organization, a nonprofit here in, in Southern California, we're based in Long Beach, We've been studying plastics for over 25 years now, but we originally started looking at how plastics were in our oceans. Um, that's the first symptom that people saw of this problem, uh, at least here in the United States. And uh, over the last few years, the movement has really grown. And I've been able to see how this happen happened with my own eyes because I, started studying plastics in 2010. And since that time, even this movement has grown so exponentially and it's really become something that is extremely powerful. Um, despite that, it's if you're not in the movement, it's hard to know what's going on. It's hard, it, it, you can watch the film and, and think, oh my gosh, why is nobody doing anything about this? But really there are thousands of organizations around the world and thousands of hundreds of thousands of individuals, including Riley, who are, you know, doing really awesome work to address this. So the first thing I want to say is that join us and just start joining, like, be, be a part of the conversation. You're, you're already doing it because you're here tonight. Um, but this is a movement that's growing. And the good thing is that with this issue of plastic pollution, um, it is intricately connected to these other environmental and social issues that we're talking about today, uh, from climate change, environmental justice, these are all connected and the solutions are connected too. So um, just becoming part of the movement, maybe you're already part of the movement, you didn't even know because you're working on a related issue. Um, but we really need to start connecting these pieces and working together to, to move in the direction that we need to. So one place that you can start if you really want to start digging in more is uh, the Break Free from Plastic uh, website. And this is a coalition. So this is a, a movement that connects all the different organizations around the world that are addressing plastic pollution. Well, not all of them. There's also other coalitions and other movements that aren't part of Break Free. There's so many people working on this issue, but this is a, a good place to start. Um, and yeah, so they're, they're really, it's been incredible being able to see how um, just personally, I've been able to connect with people around the world through my organization who are doing work in the Philippines and in Indonesia and in Texas and in uh, the Ohio River Valley and in the Bahamas and in Africa, like every, everywhere around the world, we're starting to talk about this. And that's really, really exciting. Um, but we can also just start right here at home. So uh, next slide, please. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about one of the most basic things that we can really focus on um, to be a part of the movement without really digging in a whole lot. You know, there's some simple things that we can do, and that's just about how we're talking about this issue. Um, and if you've seen the, the film, The Story of Plastic already, or if you've seen other um, related pieces to that, um, we're really starting to, to shift the way that we talk about plastic pollution and start to encompass the root causes and the systemics or the solutions that will address the fact that this is a systemic problem. Um, so I've on the screen, I've highlighted just a few of the ways that are examples of different things um, that we can use to start to change how we talk about plastic pollution. So I'll just highlight a few of the examples. So one of them is a lot of people are still really focused on the fact that we need to do more beach cleanups. But, and this is, a, this is definitely a helpful thing to do because we want our, our environment to be clean for not just us, for, for the animals that we share the planet with. Um, but we really can't look at it as a solution. We have to say, okay, well, okay, we can do this, but it, okay, it's gonna help me learn just how bad this is and help me 
realize that we need to focus on prevention. We need to stop how much plastic we're producing in the first place. So that's one way we can start to change the way we talk about plastic pollution with our friends or with our family, with our colleagues, um, with our neighbors, with the cash register <laughs> uh, person. There's, you know, anytime we're bringing up this topic, think, oh, okay, how can I really get more traction? How can I get something to really, somebody else to really care about this issue? So one way is to, of course, connect it to what they're already interested in. And most people, you know, first and foremost, they want to be healthy, they want to be safe, and they care about the human part of the problem. So another way we can, you know, start to change the way we talk about plastic pollution is say, oh, instead of saying this is a problem that's, you know, an ocean issue that's affecting turtles and fish and all sorts of marine species. Yes, that's true, but we also know that it's affecting human health and it's an environmental justice and it's a climate issue. So if you have a way in maybe in your community, there's pollution from oil extraction or there's unjust things happening to certain communities uh, and you can connect that to the, to the plastic story and that's something that you really care about, that's gonna give you way more traction to talk about plastic pollution and get somebody else to care about it too. Um, and then the last example that I'm gonna talk about is um, that, well, one thing that's happening now is a lot of people are saying, oh, okay, I've gotta use um, all my reusables, which is, which is so important. We have to really move towards reusables. But I just wanna say, we also have to be careful to, you know, we're kind of getting into that same rut where we're thinking, okay, it's the individual's responsibility to make the right choice. And so how can we start to think about how do we build whole community systems that are built around reusables and really keeping to push the, the, the narrative forward and to, to keep striving for more, for a better solution. Next slide. So one amazing thing, so that's all very like abstract and long-term thinking. There's one thing that we can do right now to start affecting policy. And this is on a national level. I know one of our speakers, I think the next speaker is gonna talk about legislation in California, but I also wanna introduce this national legislation, which is the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. And it's going to address lots of different um, things in the bill. It's a very comprehensive bill. And it's really focusing on reducing how much plastics are getting produced, making sure they're getting produced more responsibly, and making sure that companies are held accountable for how they're producing their products and also for managing the waste afterwards. Right now, it's taxpayers and um, municipal governments that are paying for these recycling systems that aren't even working that well. We really need to start to shift the game and say, okay, how can we get these companies to take responsibility? So that's what this bill is attempting to do. And you can support it um, really easily by going to the Break Free From Plastic website or the Algorita website. We'll have some links for you at the end today. And it's a simple automated email to your representatives on a national level. So that's something that you can definitely go uh, look into. And there's lots more information about the bill that I can't get into now, but um, definitely you can, there's, there's lots of information on those two sites that will explain it a bit better. And next slide. And the last thing that I want to share with you is a resource that Algorita provides. Another way to take action uh, and to learn more is Wayfinder Society. Um, and it's a tool for middle school and high school students. So if you know anybody who'd like to, to use that tool, um, it's also connected with an award. So yeah, that's it for me, I think. <laughs> Thank you, Annika. That was really interesting. I definitely recommend you guys all should join and support the Break Free from Plastic movement. Um, I actually have a couple follow-up questions for you. What do you believe is the most effective way to tackle plastic pollution? So this is a huge question, <laughs> but I wanted to answer it because um, I really, you know, I think that right now is a really exciting time um, with all of this national legislation that's happening and the legislation that's happening across the country in California, but also in other states. And um, we really have to remember that there's 
there isn't a perfect solution to this. And it's gonna, we, we have to remember that we have to, uh, we, we have to look at the small scale at the local level first and address things at a small scale. Um, we have to start building the narrative and making, getting lots of people, it's, it's already happening, but we need even more people to be aware of this issue um, so that we can actually pass these really um, impactful le legislative pieces that are coming to the table and that there's been decades of work behind them, right? We're learning and building and it's really exciting right now because we actually have you know, the potential to pass some of these things. Um, but we also have to remember like that this is this could be a really long, long-term thing that we have to work on, right? So so I just wanted to to comment and just say like I don't think there's one really like the most effective way. What we really need is we just need everybody to be critical thinkers and critical consumers and to support legislative uh, pieces to be active in government. And um, yeah, it's not easy. That's the unfortunate thing. It's not an easy thing to do, um, but we really need to, you know, everybody can do their own little part for it. And yeah, I think, I think that's my best answer to that question. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I mean, we just need to do something and, you know, change hopefully if we can do one thing we're able to make more change it's just starting small i definitely agree with all of that yeah and then the other question i had saw on your like um in your slide when you talked about standard producer responsibility another thing is like what is the best way for consumers us to let the worst polluters like coke nestle pepsi and unilever know how we feel about their products yeah so this is a tricky one too because they can they feel really far away from us right like we don't, unless you live in a community where the, there's like a, a manufacturing facility or something like that, we, we feel so disconnected from, from those companies because they're such massive companies, right? And I think what one thing that, you know, there's a lot of tools that have already been used, like um, the brand audit, which actually helped reveal who the worst polluters are. That's something that everybody can contribute to year after year. Um, that's also part of uh, the breakthrough from plastic movement. Um, there's also other things that people are doing where they're collecting their packaging and literally sending it back to the headquarters and saying, hey, this is your stuff. It's not recyclable. Do something about it. But I think where this is an unprecedented, unprecedented time with how much connection we can have to these brands. And brands are such like a deeply rooted part of our lives now which I didn't think used to always be the case. And, but we have to remember that consumers are like the main, they're the number one priority for a brand because without the consumers, they won't exist. And so we're in a position of power as consumers with how we're purchasing products. But for example, we also really need to be, you know, if there's a brand that you, you really love, but um, you made you you hate how the, their products package, right? Then that's something that you can you can whether that's through, through social media or sending a letter. Like we have to be really vocal and critical consumers, which is a a power that I don't think has really been taken advantage of yet to to its full potential. Like I think there's so much that we can do to say to start saying like we want you to do X, Y, and Z and learning from these policies that are already being put into play. And then also using our role as like sort of policing them. Like, hey, like we're pushing for this, for this policy for you to package your stuff more responsibly. And if, you know, 100,000 high school students from around the country send the same company the same message, that's something they can't listen to because that's, you know, they're losing business. Like we have to remember that this is, we do have some power there. And I think there's, you know, that's, it's not easy. I don't think it's really been done a whole lot, but we have this social media platform now that we can really like call out companies, but we can also call them out or call them in, right? To say, hey, let's, you know, we want 
to use your products, but we want you to make them better and we can't use them unless you make them better. Like, I think that's something we really need to, to sort of grow into and figure out how to do in a good way. Yeah, I love that. I, we really need to like change this narrative. We need to realize that these consumers, we are the ones in the power. We have the power to, you know, fight back to these corporations and say, no, I don't like how you're doing this. You need to be held responsible. I think that's a great way to look at it. And that definitely is something that needs to be stressed more. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that is really just being educated about what, what we need to accomplish and what we need them to do. Cause we, we have to, we have to do that work ourselves to, to be able to critique them correctly and, and positively. Yeah, definitely. And now that we have heard about the amazing National Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act and ways to call out producers of plastic pollution, let's hear about the legislation efforts here in California. We have been at the forefront for environmental change on so many policies in our country. And also how to advocate for change from your representatives. Samuel Liu is currently the Deputy Chief of Staff for State Senator Ben Allen. Senator Allen represents the West Side and Coastal South Bay in the state legislature and is a staunch environmental advocate. In his, roles, in his role as the Deputy Chief of Staff, Samuel serves as a strategic senior advisor to Senator Allen and oversees the operations of the district office. Prior to that, Samuel ran Senator Allen's successful campaign for State Senate in 2014, and most recently ran the successful Senate campaign for State Senator-elect Henry Stern. He brings prior knowledge from working in the state legislature for then Assembly Member Ted Liu, and has also worked for the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund, the Alliance for Children's Rights, as well as the Citizens Commission on Jail Violence. Samuel has a Juris Doctorate degree from Loyola Law School and a bachelor's degree from the University of California, Berkeley. Thank you so much for joining us. We are very excited to hear from you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so I'll tell you guys just a little bit about myself before I get into Senator Allen's legislation on this issue, but um, I'm a South Bay native. I grew up in, in Torrance down the street from those of you who attend Redondo Union High School. And Honestly, in high school, I thought that most people had kind of come around to the idea that plastics were bad for the environment and were, you know, leading to global warming. Fern Gully was a movie that really kind of impacted me. And I, I never thought in 2021, flash forward to my current day job, that we would still be having this conversation that we have to convince people that plastics are bad for the environment. When, you know, we went from growing up here, it was never wildfire season, and now it's become a new normal. And I think more and more, as people are educating themselves through programs like this, they are understanding that everything that we do, the behavior that we have, it's all interconnected. And so, um, wow, I don't even know where to begin because this is such a crazy topic for us. So Senator Allen has been at the forefront of this conversation in the state legislature since he's gotten elected. So he's the head of the environmental caucus. He, alongside Senator Stern, one of his buddies from um, actually when they're lawyers had always come in with a kind of singular mindset that the environmental community didn't have enough power in Sacramento. You have a lot of people who would, would include the environmental platform when they were running, but when it came to getting things done in Sacramento, it was hard pressed to find champions for this um, this area of the law. And so they really kind of took it upon themselves to use their political capital to really champion some of these bills. And what they found that they were running up against was, was big oil. I mean, I, I mean, it's not, I'm not trying to politicize it, but when, it, when you come to see the coalition of people that have the resources to fight good pieces of legislation that every newspaper editorial, every polling, every city, um, if you look at the, the list of people who are supportive of SB 54, which is a bill number that we really hope that you guys take away with you guys tonight, it's, it's common sense that we need to not just uh, be diligent as consumers about what we are purchasing and certainly contact the, the, the producers to let them know that we want you know, plastic free packaging, but also to really hold the consumers responsible. And that's where I, I love that we're working in tandem with our national partners because California should be leading the way as a progressive state 
in creating the first legislation that other states can mirror. So I have, so I can tell you a little bit about last year. So last year, the last legislative cycle, which was a year ago, we had SB 54. We really thought that this bill was going to pass. We had the, it got, it got out of the Senate. We had enough votes on the assembly side. And then at the last minute, and this is during the chaos of the pandemic and trying to you know, figure out how to keep people safe and, and, and all the kind of interesting and wild healthcare de debacles that we were dealing with at the time. So really the plastics bill was one of the hottest bills that, were going, that was going through the California state legislature last September. And every night to like, you know, two, three in the morning, we were on phone calls with advocates talking to staff of legislators who weren't firmly committed to being open about supporting but had indicated they were going to support it and at the last minute this bill never got a second hearing so for those of you who may be engaging with civics for the first time basically there's a lot of ping pong in the state legislature a bill gets introduced in the assembly it needs to be heard in the assembly on the committee side voted on the floor before it crosses over to the senate side for kind of a mirror process then it goes back so there's a lot of accountability but for whatever reason, it never came up. So SB 54 never really got a fair shot. And so this time around, we spent all summer kind of strategizing and plotting. And that's where pre becoming, you know, um, Ben Allen's deputy chief of staff, my, my whole background was in politics. It was in political advocacy, but really since then I've been focused on the state side. And I think what's been wonderful is kind of applying that same strategy and how do you be effective? How do you get things done in Sacramento, which is really, but, been our focus for the past six years, which is how do you, you know, I mean, once you're elected, the whole the whole game then is actually being an effective legislator. And that's where I think Senator Allen certainly finds the most, um, you know, bang for his buck. Um, but so a few things, I'm gonna link in the chat, um, a list of bills that I'm hoping you guys take away, not just SB 54, but we have a coalition of plastic bills that address different facets of recycling. Everything from Amazon packaging to um, simple things like um, spoon, uh, like plastic silverware. You know, it's not just SB 54. That's kind of the big daddy of this plastics package. So this is what we're focusing on. And there is a ballot measure that's qualified that's going to be on the next statewide election, the next statewide ballot. Many, maybe many of you might not be eligible to vote by then, but that's another opportunity to kind of express. Um, and, and, and support this as, as people do kind of vote this in, which is probably what we need to happen because so many of the lawmakers have had their hands tied at seemingly by oil. So anyways, I feel, was that a good synopsis? I have a lot more to say, but. Well, that was great. Thank you so much for that. I mean, it gives me a lot of hope. I was definitely really sad when SB 54 didn't get through. I was rooting for it the entire time. I was so excited. I was telling people like, did you hear about this? And for me, I didn't really know too much about like the environmental legislation part of this. I did a lot more research and I learned so much now with you going through the process of this. So you did a great job, don't worry. So, I mean, I feel like, there, I mean, I don't want to segue too quickly to the advocacy, but I do think that the, the media has finally kind of caught on. There's a lot of content out there that you can share now, everything from John Oliver, which I'm not sure if that's age appropriate or not, but he did a great segment on plastics that, um, that so I've certainly been sharing with people that, you know, or Netflix has documentaries. I think there's one right now that's on Seaspiracy that I have yet to watch. Um, but I think now that we, we this, this, there's not enough attention, I think, on this issue from the people in power. So I think it's up to your generation to kind of make it a priority. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Yeah, um, I do have a few questions I wanted to ask you if you'd be okay with that. Please. So first I wanted to know if you could tell us ways that students or people who aren't eligible to vote can help support these environmental bills. Because someone like me who was really excited for this, of course, as you know, cannot vote. So I'd love to hear what you would have to say about that. So I, I think there's there's so many different ways I can answer that question. Also, I'll put out a few different options. And the first one, which obviously do it with the, the guardrails of parents and school, but is social media. I think that has been 
there's a lot, I think, of negative things with social media, but I think certainly one of the positive things in working for an elected official, I know that they see the comments, the any kind of activity on social media, especially, so my perspective is from the state lawmakers. Um, the national lawmakers may have uh, less, maybe because they have so many followers, or they're just having less, um, they're less aware of what their social media activity looks like. I will tell you that all of the state lawmakers are directly on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. And if you're if you're DMing them, if you're commenting on things, I think if you're polite and especially especially if you rep, if they come from that district, they will listen and they will feel obligated to listen. I think that's the easiest thing, and that's that's only been made easier during the pandemic. I think it's just digital communications. The other thing too is amplifying existing channels. So I think. There's so many groups out there, like the Sierra Club, there's, you name it, any jurisdiction has maybe existing groups that just need young people to kind of help continue the work that they're doing. So locally here, I can name four or five different groups that would love to have just younger membership, certainly high school students who are there, who are committed, because these groups can't, you know, I'm, I'm sure in high school, I, I did Key Club, all right, I'm sorry, I did Interact which later on becomes rotary and it's kind of like a feeder system. I think for the same thing, and I, I don't know if Renato, I, Renato probably has a lot of clubs, but you know, the Sierra Club, when I look around at the membership of the Sierra Club, it, 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 they could use you know, some people bring down their kind of median age a little bit. And I think that's a great way to kind of use their, you know, their respected place in the community and also bring a young perspective to it. Because I don't think they have people who understand how to utilize a lot of the resources that young people have become familiar with, like TikTok, which is, I've been waiting for someone to make like a plastics TikTok video dance or something go viral. And I feel like that's an easy way that high school students can, you know, can share their resources. Another one that was touched upon before by, um, by Annika was just being a good consumer. I think tw like tweeting at the companies, I am in the companies, whether you're buying, you know, plastic, make whatever whatever consumer product that you're purchasing i think they are also responsive to social media because they have whole firms that you know do customer relations for these companies and i think if they see enough of a trend they'll it'll it'll justify maybe them looking at coming up with a different type of um, packaging you know and i think with all these different ways combined when we have these state bills, we have a federal bill, we have the consumers becoming more educated, we have young people growing a movement. And I think that's the last thing is, how do you connect? How do you connect these? So what we really need help with when it comes down to strategy, there are certain lawmakers who were too squeamish to vote on this bill last time. And we know who they are now because they didn't record their votes. And so it's very easy for us to kind of be like, hey, Evan Lowe, hey, Blanca Rubio, hey, Autumn Burke. Yeah, we're gonna call you out because that's your job to vote on these bills. And you go around saying you're an environmentalist and then you don't vote on 54. And then conveniently, uh, you get a lot of money from oil or DART or these plastics companies. So we need people and it's all public information and there's no shade on them as, you know, as people, but as lawmakers, as policymakers, they need to be held accountable. So luckily for you guys, you guys have Ben Allen and Al Marsucci representing in the state legislature, both who have, I think, the highest scores with Sierra Club, CLCV, which is the California League of Conservation Voters, which, which are groups that grade um, the kind of environmental scores of legislators. There are lawmakers out there that have very low scores. And I think those are the lawmakers that need to hear from high school students in their areas about how they feel about their votes. And I think you can start early. You can start when these votes have to go up in front of them on the assembly floor or when it might go up in front of them in committee. But certainly that's an effective way to let them know like, hey, I'm a high school student from your district and I don't like that you didn't vote for this last time and I hope you take the opportunity to correct it this time when it comes in front of you. And not just this vote, not just this bill, we've got these other nine bills that we need you to support too because this problem has been exacerbated by the pandemic. If anything, people are using more takeout, they're using more plastic, they're using more things that aren't gonna be recyclable unless we take action now. And then um, I think we, we, we can see a, well, I mean, we can see hope at the national level, but I think California has a responsibility to kind of lead the way.
Yeah, and I think tying along with what you were saying with, you know, talking to these representatives, what do you think is the best and most effective ways to reach out to your representatives? And do you think it's better to have like a form letter or more of a personal one? So if you're able to reach, so I, I'll, I'll give two answers. I think if you're coming from this area, I think you sh we should be celebrating the lawmakers that are openly supporting these bills and asking them how we can channel the energy that might come from this area out to another area that might need some convincing, right? So it might be, you know, groups might organize like, I, this is where I'm a little bit, I'm gonna age myself. They like do tweet storms or things where they're coordinating like a, like a blitz on social media. And that doesn't matter where you're coming from. That, that could be from Redondo, could be from, you know, San Francisco can come from other jurisdictions that have already kind of committed to a plastics free um, community, but their neighbors haven't. And those are the people that like, you know, through sports, through academics, through other ways, now you can connect with high school students. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how, but I'm sure there's safe ways to do so and find other like like-minded groups like that, you know, you can, you can kind of synergize with and share this and be like, hey, we really need your help. Really, like Autumn Burke down the street, she represents Venice and Marina Del Rey and Inglewood. Like there must be some way that people know through, through you know, whatever community ties, how do you encourage those people to encourage their legislators to vote? And so that's, you know, I think form letters in our office, what we do is we count form letters. We don't necessarily read them individually. I think if people take the time to personalize things, um, there will be someone on the receiving end that will take the time to read it because they can quickly kind of identify how much time someone took to send it. And so, you know, I think, but that's not to say, I don't, I don't want to, I think an effective form letter, like the, a lot of the petitions that you see online, the effective ones, I mean, the recall is a perfect example. That one was a very effective, you know, way that people advocated for. So I think it can be, People need to, I think, just use their voice more and stop thinking that other people can do their thinking for them. Because a lot of the politicians don't really have their best interests at heart is what we're seeing on the environmental side. And there's not enough sp spotlighting around these issues right now, so. Thank you, Samuel, for all that great information. I'm definitely- I see, Okay, I see a question in the chat about phone calls to elected officials. So right now it's interesting because as everything's remote, I don't know that phone calls are being recorded in the same way, I, but I think as, so yes, I think phone calls are effective. I don't know that they can necessarily go directly to the lawmaker. And I think if you wanna make sure that the lawmaker is gonna see your message for a state lawmaker, I would DM them. I would, I think that's the most effective and that could be a form DM, but not a lot of people are DMing or commenting you know, as long as you're like a polite kind of commenter, I think they will respond to Mike. Yeah, thank you for that, Samuel, and all the great information about upcoming legislation and tips on how to be an effective political advocate for environmental policies. Um, now let's focus more specifically on what you as an individual can do in your daily life to make a difference. Our third speaker, Ali Abbas Yeager, is here to talk about how to reduce your use. For the past decade, Ali has worked with environmental nonprofits to cultivate behavior changes to protect our planet. Currently, Ali is the Director of Impact and Sustainability at Human IT, a nonprofit that takes technology that would normally be recycled or sent to a landfill and refurbishes it to redistribute to low-income families. Previously, she has served as the Recycling Center Coordinator at California State University Long Beach, where she oversaw the Recycling Center, as well as the Co-Executive Director at Grades Green, a nonprofit dedicated to inspiring kids to care for the earth. Take it away, Allie. Thank you, Riley, for that, that thoughtful introduction. I'm so thrilled to be here this evening. Just, you know, so privileged to be a part of this conversation. Thank you for facilitating it, Riley. And Sam and Annika, so inspired by what you've brought tonight. Um, and I've learned so much from your presentation. So really just so excited to be able to kind of hopefully wrap this up for us a little bit. 
Um, and, and as Riley said in my bio, my roots are really grades of green all the way. And what I love about grades of green, many, many things, but it's this approach of educate yourself and do something about it, right? It's the take in the knowledge, have that human reaction of, oh gosh, this is big, this is scary, this is hard, that's all real. And then have fun building a community around creating some solutions, right? Um, and I, I recently got addicted to the podcast, How to Save a Planet. And if you haven't checked it out, I highly recommend it. It's good stuff. And I'm sorry, I'm going to spoil my favorite episode that they did for you right now. But there's the one they did in mid-March, and it was about um, your carbon footprint. And they hash out that debate of what matters more, individual action or holding companies accountable. And I, as I said, I'm sorry, I'm about to spoil it. So cover your ears if you would hate that. But what they conclude is it's really both. You know, it's take individual actions, inspire your community, your network to join you, and use that to leverage organizations and companies, corporations, and government to be accountable to what they're doing and the, the choices they're making. So it's a yes and in, in every way. And I think the other thing I'd like to say in the opening here is so many times over the years, I've had friends and folks come to the conversation of what do I do? And they automatically jump to a place of lack. What are all the things I have to give up? What do I have to stop doing? What do I have to punish myself for essentially? And uh, I'd really like to shift that perspective on what do we get to gain by making these changes? We get to gain community and getting to know our neighbors a little bit more, understanding where our food comes from and getting to connect with the people who grow it versus buying it in a plastic clamshell, right? So there's just so much to gain here. And I think if you're able to look at reducing your use from a place of abundance and creativity, it's so much more fun and it's so much more sustainable, you know, for the long term, both for the environment and yourself, right? So instead of creating the shame spiral of, oh my gosh, I got a piece of plastic, I'm a terrible person, coming at it from a place of curiosity. Hey, I have this piece of plastic. That's interesting. Where did this come from? How did it get into my home? Did I need it? What could I have done differently next time? And use it as a, a moment for reflection versus shaming, right? Um, so with that, we can go to the next slide. And as Riley said, I, I had an experience managing a recycling center for a period of time. It was managed by college students at a college university. And it just really shed light onto really what wish cycling is and what it looks like right now. And if you haven't heard this silly but very useful term, wish cycling is that moment when you want something to be recycled so bad that you put it in the recycle bin. And you hope it gets recycled because it's clean and it's plastic and it should be recycled, right? But unfortunately, very often it's not. Um, and it's a lie that we were told by the, the plastics industry. They want us to believe that one through sevens can be recycled. Um, what I learned, and this is actually covered really well in a Netflix documentary called uh, Broken. They have a series of societal systems that are broken. One of them focuses on recycling. They break this down very well. But essentially the plastics movement encouraged recyclers um, to have this triangle on all of their packaging so that consumers felt good about buying the product, showing that, hey, this has the potential to be recycled. But the reality is one through sevens, you know, it's, it's not common for all of them to be able to be recycled at a facility. And quick little history on that or um, lesson on, on what that kind of looks like. Our recyclables, if they're placed in the right bin, they don't become litter, they go to a recycling facility, it's called a MRF, Materials Recovery Facility. And this is the location where people and, and uh, conveyor belts and things sort all the materials coming in, the materials get bailed, and then they get sent to a recycler. So unfortunately, most recycling centers don't have the ability to process all these plastics, these one through sevens. And the ones that are in green here, the ones, twos, and fives, those are the ones that are most likely to be recycled, but it's not always a guarantee, right? So it's just a, a really good reminder that the one through seven just indicates that, hey, this is made of a mixed plastic material. It could be recycled. It doesn't necessarily mean it gets recycled in my area. So step one, I would encourage you to just do a little bit of curiosity digging in your, your local area, what actually gets recycled um, and how and where. Talk to some local experts. If you're in the South Bay, um, Lisa Ryder Moore, I know she's part of the Grades of Green community. She is just a, a wealth of knowledge and taught me so much of what I know on the recycling industry. So there's a ton of great information out there, especially where we live. Take a minute to educate yourself on what actually can and can't be recycled. And that, that really helps a lot too. Um, next slide, please. 
Thank you. So if you're wondering where to start, um, these are both places you can start and just like a plastics health check. I do these things often with friends and in my personal home. Um, the first is doing an in-home waste audit. At Grades of Green a few years ago, we learned about trash on your back and it's exactly what it looks like. It's that photo on the right where some people very boldly kept a plastic bag on their back and put all their trash in it for a day, a week, a month. And then you audit and you say, what am I collecting? Where's the stuff coming from? What can I reduce? Um, some people even get so advanced as to do a trash jar. That's next level where you're, you know, you're doing pretty well, but you can start to really just see what are the little bits of plastic I'm collecting. And again, at the end of that period of time, you take a, a little audit and see where did this come from? And is there just one place I can reduce or eliminate those plastics? Um, Another strategy I really encourage is one zone at a time. It's very overwhelming to look at your whole home and just decide I'm going plastic free tomorrow. It can be really expensive and it, it can create a lot of waste because then you might be throwing out things that still have a life cycle to them, right? So if you already have something plastic in the home, use it up first. No need to get rid of it right away. It's already there. Um, so one zone at a time, I suggest focusing on a kitchen or a bathroom or your backpack, like pick one zone that you're curious about and see how you can make some shifts there to be a little bit more plastic free. Uh, third tip is to buddy up. I have a, a close friend who works in the environmental space as well. And she and I constantly talk about what we wanna work on next together and how we can help keep each other accountable and what resources we can find. So it keeps it fun. It keeps a sense of community with it. And it makes it feel, again, less like a punishment. It's more of a, an exercise that you can do to, together and with other people. One of my favorite quotes, you know, it's down here at the bottom is not everyone has to be doing this perfectly, right? We need millions of people doing it imperfectly and constantly challenging both their personal actions and then reflecting that outward of how can I hold companies accountable? How can I give feedback to companies saying, hey, I did an in-home waste audit. 90% of my stuff came from your company. Help me fix that right? And keeping people accountable, um, more so than people, but, you know, big companies as well. It really does matter. And here's just some great places to start that I hope people find inspiring. And then one more slide, if we can. The last thing I'd suggest is just consider these questions. What resources are already available to you? For example, do you have a really great farmer's market locally that if you rearranged your weekly schedule, you could get to and buy a few more items that are not in plastic, get to know the people who grew the food, start those relationships. And you know, there's so many benefits to that. So take a look at what's already going on in your area. Um, I recently moved to a new city and one of my hobbies on the weekends has been to call some of the restaurants and just ask them like, I would love to order takeout from you. What's your packaging like? And if they say, oh, you know, we use plastic, we use styrofoam, I tell them, I'm like, that's such a bummer. I'd really love to try your food, but I can't buy from you. So I'll try again in a few months. And, and I hope to see that you change your uh, packaging then, right? So even just getting to see what's already available in your area. Um, next question you can ask is what skills do you have that can make this easier and more fun? Are you naturally an artist? Are you a chef? Do you love to make DIY beauty products? Are you really into film and technology? What is your, your thing that keeps you excited, you know? And can you integrate going zero waste into that and reducing your plastic? Maybe that's your zone that you start with. Um, another category is what fringe benefit goals do you have? You know, are you trying to be healthier, like in your body, reducing plastics really helps with that. Annika talked about that a bit about how it's, you know, more than a litter concern. It's really a human health concern too. So consider what other fringe benefits you have and, and what you're working towards and how this could be a part of that. And again, the goal is to make meaningful, impactful changes, but also to stumble forward, know that you're going to make mistakes. It's not always easy, but get curious, make a few changes at a time, get a community around you to do it and um, take that up, hold companies accountable. Yeah, and that's it for me. Oh, last slide. I forgot about this one. Just some of my favorite resources. Um, some are local to the South Bay. Some are a little bit more broad reaching, but a few great little tidbits that I turn to often for inspiration and support. And that's it for me. Thanks, Riley. Thank you, Allie. Um, I did want to ask a couple more questions for you. Um, you did already elaborate a lot on ways people can do things, but I wanted to ask more sp specifically, as you were talking about wish cycling, what should people do instead of wish cycling, as you mentioned, if you have any more you'd like to elaborate on?
There we go. Am I unmuted? Okay, great. Um, it, wish cycling is really challenging. I mean, I'll be honest, if something's clean and empty and I'm not sure if it can be recycled, I still recycle. <laughs> um, the goal is always to try to reuse it first if I'm also not sure if I can get one more round of life cycle out of that item. Um, my friends and I found a, a cat shelter recently that was collecting plastic Tupperwares to give kittens medicine and food. So that was a specific, you know, if we have plastic, here's a way that it can at least be reused one more time. So if you think it can be recycled and you haven't found any information that it can't, try to reuse it first, try to reduce it, avoid it the next time, recycle it. If it's something that you know is mixed material, um, a good example is like those envelopes that have the little plastic window. They have some funky glues and things in them. Those can't be recycled. So when I get those, like number one, I try to call the company that sent it, like, don't send me this stuff. I don't want it. I'm, I'm opting into paperless. Number two, make a grocery list on it, try to use it, you know? So pretty basic things like that. I wish I had a better answer, but I think those are the best options we have at the moment. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, I think one other thing, um, going along the lines of, you know, what is your go-to plan for reducing your use? Like, I know some great things are like bring your own or refill stations. Like, why don't you talk about refill stations if you're willing to do that? Oh my gosh, that's like a Christmas day going to a refill station, right? So, so the catch is to go in only to get things you actually need. It's very easy for, for me to say, I want a new dish sponge and I want all these things, but really like use up what you have first, right? But if you go into a refill store, it's, it's really wonderful. We have a few in Long Beach. Um, Algolita actually has a really great one right in front of their, um, their research center called BYO Long Beach. There's two of those in the Long Beach area, actually. And in the South Bay, um, Stephanie runs the Wasteless Shop, which is a fantastic resource. Um, there's, there's a few others in LA as well. Um, sustain LA. So there, there's a few throughout California now. We're really lucky. But essentially, you can go in, bring your own containers, jars, yogurt containers, what have you, and fill up on all kinds of home goods. There's shampoo, conditioner, toothpaste, laundry detergent, um, all kinds of things. And they do it by weight. So you fill up your container as much as what you need. They weigh it. And then you, you know, pay for the materials and they take out the weight of the actual container. And I think that's a great way to vote with your dollar, right? Support those small businesses who are giving us these awesome ways to get better products. And um, on a side note to that, I, I'm not just saying this, but every product I've gotten from a zero waste store is so much higher quality <laughs> besides not having to pay for the packaging. Like the shampoo is fantastically better. The dish soap smells a million times better. So it's also just a really lovely, like, experience for your home. I, I really do feel like that's an example of abundance. Like I'm not giving anything up. I'm getting such better products and it's a lot more fun. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Ali. We should definitely use more refill stations. Um, I hope at this time, all of our participants have had have some ideas about what they can do to tackle plastic pollution. I wanna thank everyone for your great questions, but due to time limits, we will have to follow up on those at a later time. Of course, they'll be posted on our webpage. But wrapping up, I wanted to ask our wonderful presenters, what can young people do to make a difference or take action in their community? Um, let's start with Allie right now, if you're up for that. Oh my gosh, of course. Um, I really appreciated what Sam said. It was community focused. Get involved in a, a local group, a local organization. I really appreciated all the perspective tonight too on to the extent that your family is comfortable with it engaging in social media appropriately not to give angry emojis and you know use all caps that can be really aggressive and and turn people away from the point you're making but to share like hey this is what I want to do this is what I'm seeing make better choices and this is how I'm voting with my dollar. So having just that moment to thoughtfully reach out to elected officials and companies via their social media platforms before this conversation, I didn't really see that as, as powerful as it sounds like it is. So I think that's a really great thing for, for people to be able to leverage right now. Now, what do you think, Samuel? Um, I think everything that's been said tonight, I, I continue to echo. And I also think that the, I guess if, if, if you, if your generation can, 
can really find a way to reach to reach out to other high schoolers or other people your age that might live in other regions of California or other states, certainly other states down the line, but right now just in other parts of California and be like, hey, my state legislator is is supporting this bill, carrying this bill. Um, what is your state legislator doing? And just starting a conversation about how this impacts everyone, whether you live in Riverside or Redondo Beach, you know. So that's that's like an active takeaway because I I think the the conversation can't just like stay with the adults. I think we need to start in high school and just have people start thinking about that until these issues are resolved. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, and then let's go to Annika for this. I think that one of the most important roles of youth is holding adults accountable and being so, so, so vocal and saying we like just, yeah, saying, because I, I, I don't want it to just be, okay, it's the next generation's job to do this, the next generation's job to do this, the next generation's job. Like go up and say, you guys, need to put everything you actually have into this right now like it's and I because I don't want it to I don't want young people to feel I don't want myself to feel like I'm responsible I'm the only one or nobody else is responsible because you've already been doing it the other way like educate your parents and <laughs> like educate your teachers demand that your teachers teach this in class is in class and like um, but on the other hand, that's that's hard work to do too. So be, you know, find what gives you joy and you know, join youth groups that are being really active. There's so many youth movements that are happening. Um, so find what fits for you so that you have that support. Like that's gonna be really important too. So. Yeah, thank you. And then I have one last overall question, and that would be. What gives you hope when looking at the future of plastic pollution in the environment? I think this is a good thing we should discuss. Um, let's first start with Sam. I think because California is such a huge economic powerhouse that if we're able to achieve SB 54 and to break free from plastics in California, we can we can start an international trend because there's not gonna they're not gonna create a product just for the California market, and we're consumer driven culture. And so if we're able to, you know, if we're able to pass this, I I think we could be looking at it like the the beginnings of an international national movement in this space, and that gives me hope. Thank you. And then let's go to Annika for the next. Oh, I forgot to meet myself. Uh, I so what gives me hope is the fact that when when I was in high school, which wasn't even that long ago, <laughs> people weren't talking about this, and now every single kid that I've met recently is talking about this. Of course, that might be a little bit biased, but um, so yeah, it's this is hap it's happening. It's happening it's going to happen faster than, than we think it might in the end. Like, it's going to take a while to ramp, but it's ramping really quick. What about you, Allie? I agree with everything that's been said. I think the other thing that gives me hope, and I would not have said this a year ago, is the role of technology. Uh, with my role at Human IT, I've really gotten to see both what technological advances there are in the sustainability space, how we can create circular economy models around technology, and what people who use technology well can leverage it to do. So I think the ability to accelerate up that ramp, as Anika was saying, technology is a great resource in that if we use it well, right? With everything good, there's a bad side too. It's got a dark side for sure. But I'm really excited that there's so many platforms for people globally to connect on issues like this, to mobilize on issues like this. And I hope for youth, it helps you feel more connected because um, it's not just something that you should all deal with. It's a we problem. It's a universal problem for every generation. And I think technology helps to, to bring that to light and bring more power to it. And there's just so many more platforms to, to move the needle further on this now. 
Yeah, I agree with everything you were saying. And going along the lines with what gives you hope, um, my grade to green advisor, Robin Murphy, is going to tell you a bit about the program and how to get involved in grade to green. Thank you, Riley. Um, so as Riley mentioned earlier, this absolutely amazing panel discussion that she put together is part of her Grades of Green Climate Solutions campaign project. Um, Grades of Green is an environmental nonprofit. We were founded in 2009. Um, it mentors and guides students to become environmental leaders in the community. So over the past 11 years, Grades of Green has reached over 600,000 students, um, inspiring and empowering them to take action and become environmental leaders and advocates. So this year alone, we're working with over 80 student teams all over the world who are all taking action on climate change through various projects in their community, just like this. So any student that would like to get involved and lead a project like this can join our RISE campaign program for free where they'll receive one-on-one -on -one mentorship from one of our staff members and be guided through a step-by-step -step program that will first teach them about environmental issues and then coach them through designing a project to take environmental action in their own community. So for anyone who would like to learn more or join our campaigns, you can go to our website at gradesofgreen.org. So thank you, Riley. Absolutely wonderful job. This has been a great program. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. I personally know how amazing this organization is. I have been a part of it since I was six years old, so I definitely know. Um, now to wrap up all this great information and give you some additional resources, I want to I want to encourage you guys to check out my Reduce Your Use campaign webpage and the websites for these great organizations. These links are also included on my webpage, in addition to a link to help you locate and contact information for representatives. Additional, additionally, I have a long list of actions for you to access to fight for our environment, including petitions to sign, letters to send to representatives, and much more. Also on the site, we will post responses to questions we were not able to get to tonight, and a link to the recording for the panel if anyone missed it, or if you want to send it out to people feel free to do that. I'll be sending a follow-up email to all of you because I'd love to get your feedback on my project and hopefully find out if I was able to inspire you guys to reduce your use of single-use plastics. I want to thank everyone so much for coming to this discussion panel and hopefully you were able to watch. Oh, next slide, please. I want to thank you guys so much for coming to this discussion panel and hopefully you were able to watch the very informative and empowering documentary the story of plastic if you haven't seen the film yet our link has been extended to may 1st Woohoo! so sign up on our web page to watch that i definitely recommend it and it is a great way to celebrate earth month i especially want to thank our three wonderful speakers tonight who taught us about easy ways to stop plastic pollution in our communities as well as Grade to Green for helping me with my project. Now, before we end tonight, I wanna to share some inspiring thoughts. First, my motto. It doesn't matter what size or age you are, you can change the world and make a difference. Remember, we only have one earth, so let's take care of it and give back all that it has provided us. And lastly, and most importantly, we can't recycle our way out of the problem. Reduce your use. Good night and thank you all again, everyone.